Welcome to the Driving the World podcast series. I'm your host, Cully Holland. Today we have Tom Franke, our industry solution provider for the entry logistics and parcel handling, and we're going to be talking about his industry. Hey, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here. Good to be here. So we, uh, we're going to be talking about your industry, yeah. and that is parcel handling and entry logistics. Mm-hmm. So let's just start off and figure out what is that? Yeah, so the parcel industry is those carriers that, uh, and we all know the nationwide ones that, you know, basically they provide, uh, they consolidate packages that go from the shipper to the receiver, which could be, you know, certainly the receiver being a a store, maybe another distribution center, or maybe a, a house. And then we also, we all know about the national, the large national ones. There's also regional ones as well that might service a four or five state area. And then we put in there intra logistics because there are many, and I'm sure you, you're aware that there's many retailers that use basically the same type of setup as those parcel companies where they have distribution centers. And that industry in particular has really, really grown, as I'm sure you, you can realize with, uh, uh, you know, even with COVID, of course, and then even prior to that. So um, that's really what we mean by intra logistics. Intra logistics is the movement, officially, is the movement of goods within four walls within a distribution center or a manufacturing facility. Right now, we're talking distribution center. Well, between those two, it sounds like that is going to be a bulk of business, a lot of stuff moving back and forth, A to B. Yep. So where do you fit in? So we have your title, we know who you are, but yeah, what do so, you do? Yeah, basically my job is to uh, grow market share within that particular industry. And there's a number of ways of doing that. Uh, uh, I meet with the larger end users from the executive level uh, all the way down to the field level. Maybe we're providing, we're working with the executive levels on specifications, standards, that sort of thing. Uh, field level, there's a solutions that might, we might be able to provide. They have a problem. We take a look at that. I'll work with our field sales engineers and also our MCPs, our motion control product engineers, and on, on something like that. Um, so if you can imagine that there is, let's say, for instance, and also I should say that I work with the OEMs as well. So I want to be the conduit of those conveyor OEMs to say this is what we're talking with on this end user. This is what he, this is what they're looking for. This is what they would like to go. This is where they would like to go. And by the way, we can provide this to the OEM as well. So I want to work, I want to establish a relationship with the OEM. Um, many times that particular OEM has a standard that they go with. And so one of the jobs that I have also might entail, let's, let, let's take a, for instance, a, a typical purchase order right. that we would have. That, yep. The purchase order is actually cut from the OEM itself. So let's say there's a large distribution center that's coming up, and OEM has, a particular OEM has that project. Now, the end user, it, it, it's kind of a spectrum as to who decides on what component to use. And this when I say component, I mean, you know, the typical, you know, bearings. And in this case, we would be the drive units or the gear motors or the VFDs. Um, usually the OEM has a particular standard that they want. And then the end user could say at the very end, at the very end of the one spectrum, say, hard spec, I want SEW Euro drive. Okay. Oh, it's like that. Always like that. Yeah, always. That like would be that. great if it always yeah. was. And my, you know, I wouldn't have a job anymore, I guess. Okay. <laughs> so um, basically, if you can imagine, uh, you know, the OE or the end user might say something like, well, we can go with brand A, but we can also go with brand B or C. And in this case, or the OEM might say, well, I really want brand D. So sometimes there's this mix in between. It's kind of a gray area a lot of times as to who decides what uh, drive unit manufacturer is used. Well, sounds like you definitely uh, run the gauntlet. We're going from top of the food chain 
all the way down to right. the people turning the wrenches. Right. Everybody's important, so I'm glad you're talking to everybody. Yep. But it sounds like with the OEMs, which is original equipment manufacturers, right. just to be clear, that is kind of the entrance for maybe some of our listeners who may be end users that are receiving these products of where SEW and yourself fit in. Because I heard you mention conveyors, and that is one of the things that we do very well. Yep. So in these distribution plants, in the intra logistics and parcel handling, is it just a conveyor? Like where does SEW actually fit in and help provide yeah. solutions where our end users may actually see us and understand what we're doing? Right. Yeah. If you take a look at a typical distribution center, let's say there's just a number, I mentioned conveyors, there's a number of different types of conveyors that are used. Um, so if we take a, maybe the simple, a simple outline might be something to the effect of, we have a truck that comes in and that's on the inbound side, of course. We have a, an unloader, who usually it's manual. And by the way, there's a lot of opportunity there to try and automate going from picking up the parcel itself off the truck and onto the conveyor. So we put that parcel on a conveyor. Generally, it's called the loader because it's, it's, it's or I'm sorry, the unloader. I'm sorry, because it's unloading off of, the, off of the truck. And then from there, we have a bunch of unloaders, conveyors, that all divert then to a mainline conveyor or a bulk conveyor. And now on that big bulk conveyor, we have several different types of packages. We have all different types of sizes, and uh, there could be poly bags as well. So what we need to do is ultimately those packages are going to need to run through a tunnel where they scan code there to see where it should go within the system. So first we need to singulate all those packages into a nice row. So that goes through, of course, what's called a singulator. I love these names. Yeah. It makes sense. Exactly, right? And so then we, we, we put through a singulator. Now we have to make sure that there's proper gap in between each of these packages. So we put it through a gapper. Perfect. Goes through the tunnel. Um, the system knows where that package needs to go. And from there, it goes through a sorter. So the sorter will, will, will push the package one way or the other on, onto a conveyor of which that needs to go. So, and then from there, we, uh, and then from there it's loaded onto the, this is the outbound truck. So we went from unloading to loading again. It right. sounds like we covered the whole process. Yeah. And throughout that process, it sounds like we have some more simplistic conveyors. We're going A to B. We got to make sure we can move the weight. That's it. We're getting there. And then you were talking about singulators, gappers, mm -hmm. some scanners involved. It sounds like we're getting the slightly more complex motion, a little bit of positioning and understanding and knowledge about the line. So does SEW have something? For the entire plant, like where does SEW specifically fit into these multiple conveyors that are seen in a typical distribution plant? Yeah, right now we provide the bulk of what we provide is our uh, standard induction motors, IE3, IE being the efficiency standard of, 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 of the motors themselves. Um, so we have our K-Box, which is our helical bevel, as you know. Uh, that's a very, very popular unit of ours in that industry. Uh, usually that K box can be mounted uh, on the pulley itself, on the, the, the drive pulley, or it can be tucked underneath the conveyor and then, you know, connected with an auxiliary drive with, with, the, with the drive pulley. Um, we also do a lot of our R box, which is essentially our inline where it's going to be tucked underneath there. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that we see in this industry. Um, there's really some, I would say there's, there's three big initiatives that okay. are coming up the, the horizon here is, is, is a move from IE3 to IE5, not sure where IE4 came in, but there's IE5 standards that are, that have been, um, written right now. And so we see a lot of end users wanting to go to IE5, um, which of course is our, uh, permanent magnet motors, synchronous motors. Just and trying to get that efficiency level. Trying to, to get that level. efficiency level. Yeah, exactly. And then also we see a push for decentralization. So decentralization, of course, we're, we're basically the pioneers 
of decentralization with our Movimot that was introduced years ago. Um, so we have products for that as well. You know, obviously, our uh, when we talk about IE5 and decentralization, we're talking about um, our Movi Gear performance, our Movi Mop performance. Um, so just to, I don't know if you're familiar with what decentralization is, but we'll, we'll start by explaining what centralize Yeah, is. let's start there. You know, that's simply taking a, um, we have a control panel that has the VFDs and the PLCs all in one location. And then we have cables that run to the drive unit itself. So you have one centralized location for, for the controls. Right. Now, what decentralized does is it takes that control, that con the controller, and puts it at, on, or near the drive unit itself. So there's a lot of advantages to that. Of uh, modifications is, are going to be a lot easier with conveyors. Uh, we have less cabling than we do uh, with, uh, less cabling with decentralized than we do with centralized. Uh, we also have, um, of course, the energy savings with the IE5 that I was talking about. Um, so there's a number of advantages to this. Um, so that's a big push. IE5 is a big push. Decentralization is a big push. And then we also see a move more towards AGVs. Okay. Automated guided vehicles. Yep, yep. So AGVs, the advantage to AGVs really is the fact that we are not confined of moving parts only to a certain conveyor. Um, the AGVs allow the, the product to be moved at wherever location needs to be. Also, uh, you know, there's a lot of non-conveyable packages, such as maybe a ladder or something like that. Uh, generally, those need to go on what's called a tugger right now, where we have basically a train that that, the, or maybe sometimes the uh, a, a person themselves will just take a will, will take a cart and just push that ladder over to where it needs to be. Right. So we see a lot of need for AGVs uh, a lot of times because of the non-conveyables. Wow. So. Going back to the beginning of that with the uh, IE3 motors that we're already doing, bulk of the business, that's pretty much our integrated DRN with our K and R boxes, two right. of our high efficiency right. gearboxes right there. And then it sounds like SEW is already prepared, willing, and able to take care of our customers as they take the next step. As you were saying, moving into IE5, that higher efficiency class, we have the decentralized portfolio, which... Once again, we're the pioneers of exactly. we've been doing it a long time, yeah. so we're very yeah. comfortable with it. And then the AGVs, which I know just from our own plant here in South Carolina, right? We utilize them, and they're SCW, and we have our Movi Trans technology for that contactless energy, where they're running the cables to the ground. They have a pickup, which is pretty much an industrial size contactless phone charger, yep. and it powers everything in there. So I'm glad to hear that with these new steps on the horizon for parcel and logistics, SCW already in it we already yeah. have solutions yeah waiting for our customers yeah we're in a, we're in a very very fine spot right now i mean you know to to go to that next step and i think there's a lot of interest in those three things that i was mentioning you know? I, I can uh, see how so a lot of times what we do is if if i go to an end user or something like that and say look we can save you this much in efficiencies we will be we'll we're willing to take in a movie gear and say look just try it out. Let's do a test. I've done this a number of times where, you know, we test the existing drive unit on the power consumption, maybe for two weeks, that sort of thing. And then also, then we take in the Movi gear, say, and then do energy readings off of that for two weeks. And then we can show them just exactly how much power they're, they're, they can save. And the proof is in the pudding. Exactly. So I think we've covered a lot yeah. when it comes to this yeah. industry that I'm sure a lot of people just forget about. They just rely on it. You know, things go from A to B. It's awesome. It's magic. Nothing happens behind the scenes. So I think yeah. and right. hope our listeners have learned a few things. Is there anything we missed or anything else you'd like to cover on it? Uh, no, not that I can think of. Hopefully uh, you, uh, the audience has gained a little bit of understanding of what we're trying to do here is uh, to grow our market share and also just to really to, to help out the end user and the, and the conveyor OEMs as well. So. Yep. Like 
trying to provide solutions. Yes. And if any listeners do have more questions, they can always feel free to reach out to their local SUW sales rep, any of the plants, engineering offices, and of course, we'll happy to get them some more information. Yep. Well, Tom, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming by. Great being here, Cully. Always good to see you. Yeah. All right.